Great. Um, welcome, everybody. It's uh, 12 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, so we're ready to get this webinar started. Um, hopefully, my sound is coming through loud and clear. Um, my name is Hillary Hayes, and I work for Utah State University uh, for the Center of Employment and Inclusion. And my role here at Utah State University is to provide training and technical assistance to service providers who offer employment services to individuals with disabilities. And my posi position was made possible um, because Utah State University has partnered with the Department of Workforce Services. And with their funding and support, we're able to provide various trainings and webinars for you all as service providers. Um, so just a couple of things before we get started. Um, first and foremost, I'm gonna go over a couple of things in regards to Zoom. Um, please keep your microphone muted throughout this webinar um, and hold all questions until the end. If you do have um, any questions or comments throughout the training, please feel free to type them into the chat box, um, which you can you know, view by pressing um, the chat button, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the webinar, or at the end, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, also in the chat box, I'm going to upload a copy of a PDF form of the PowerPoint presentation, so please feel free to download that. Um, and because um, this is a grant funded project, um, uh, I'm required to collect data on what we do in regards to training. So at the end of the webinar, I will send out a link to an anonymous evaluation. Please take a couple of minutes um, to complete that survey. Um, it really helps us know what we need to improve upon and also what trainings you all as service providers want us to host in the future. Um, and also at the end of the webinar, I will upload a certification of completion into the chat box for everyone to download. Um, we also have another webinar coming up next week on March 26th, which is going to be about working with individuals with co-occurring brain injury and uh, substance use related challenges um, presented actually by Maria's colleague, Anastasia Edmonston. Um, so I'll post a link to our website in the chat box as well. So if you'd like to attend that webinar or any future webinars, um, you'll be able to register. Um, and on our, web on our website, we also have a ton of pre-recorded webinars um, that you guys can view. They're all really good. Um, now with all that said, I'm really excited to have Maria Crowley here today. Um, Maria is the Director of Professional Development for NASHIA, and she's worked in um, the disabilities field um, with uh, state government for 30 years, and specifically in brain injury since the year 2000. Um, so I'm excited to have her talk a bit about brain injury and the impact on employment. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation um, and uh, appreciate you, Hillary, in particular, and the Center for Employment Inclusion for hosting this. Um, I hope that you guys learn something from me, or at least I give you some information that's thought-provoking. Um, something else to share about myself. I started off in my professional life as a job coach, which I think is a great entry into the world of um, working with individuals with disabilities is a nice crash course for me and it gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of businesses and and individuals um, so I'm going to share some of what I learned in that realm before switching over to working in the field of traumatic brain injury. Um, Hillary maybe before we start um, I'd love to know who you guys are and what, you know, a little bit more about uh, your backgrounds so that'll help me frame some of the things I'm going to talk about. So Hillary's going to launch a poll. If you guys would take a minute just to respond. And basically, you know, it's just asking, are you somebody that works in this field already as a vocational rehabilitation counselor or an employment specialist? Are you another kind of community provider or are you somebody with lived experience? And then the second question is whether or not you've ever worked with someone who has a brain injury. Looks like almost half of you are VR counselors. And about a quarter of you work as employment specialists. I'll share the uh, polling results okay. too. Awesome. There we go. <laughs> okay, that helps a lot. 
Um, thank you for joining. I see about 20% of you are in the other category. So we'll just see how that um, looks as we go. And um, I'm happy to see that most of you have worked with someone who has a brain injury because that's going to help a lot. I'll skip over some of um, the basics. So thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. And I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully you all can um, see the right thing. Okay. So today we're going to just spend a little bit of time talking some about brain injury incidents, causes and types, because it does impact what the world of work might be like for someone who has a brain injury. A little bit about the challenges that that might bring to someone personally or um, if they're pursuing education or work. Some basic information about accommodations and strategies that you can employ when you work with a person. And then at the end, we'll do a little bit on resources and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. So most of you have worked with somebody with a brain injury. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time delineating the differences here. Um, but I just have a slide up because I want to be sure everyone has access to the information that I'm running through. Um, it's just brain injury defined. So what is acquired brain injury in terms of whether it's traumatic or not traumatic, which means is it something that was caused by an internal event or something that's caused by an external event? Sometimes the challenges are the similar. Um, sometimes um, they're not. A little bit about what brain injury is and isn't, because for the general public, sometimes it's confusing um, what it might not include. Sometimes people want to lump in uh, something that's a gradual change in cognitive function, um, like dementia, or the effects of substance use, or other kinds of um, disability categories, and we know that's not it. Uh, brain injury, and I'll probably use traumatic brain injury because so many states use a definition of traumatic brain injury uh, because that's where their funding source is. Um, but we can say brain injury overall is something that causes a sudden change, um, a new normal um, for a person, and that comes sometimes with temporary or longer lasting challenges. A little on brain anatomy and what the inside of a person's head looks like. You can see towards the front of the skull, it's not smooth on the inside. And so when we talk about frontal lobe damage, you can see why that area might have some additional trauma if the brain gets moved around in there. Um, I always like to include a slide that covers um, brain, brain anatomy and function. So you can always refer back to it if you need to look at um, what areas of the brain are controlling which things. Uh, your brain controls everything about you, as you already know, and the area of damage dictates the area of challenge later on. So you can see that frontal lobe, we're going to spend a fair amount of our time living in frontal lobe challenges because those are often where we see the most um, difficulties with people coming back home and returning to community and on to employment. So some causes of brain injury, and I know you're familiar with these as well if you've worked with somebody with a brain injury, but again, I kind of like to point some of these out. Currently, falls for the very young and for older adults are at the top of the list in terms of cause. Um, you see additional causes on here um, related to other blows to the head, blasts within the military, um, choking and strangulation, which happens often to victims of domestic violence, um, sports, fights, um, anoxic injuries that come from near drowning, all causes of brain injury. This is how it happens. Where is it? Um, and I have some images on here. It does involve uh, things that happen to people at home. 
um, falls and assaults. Um, it happens on the road with car crashes. It happens within schools, um, both on the field and off the field. It's not all sports related concussion we're talking about. It's all brain injury. Within treatment centers, um, individuals come into substance use recovery centers um, often with a diagnosed or an undiagnosed brain injury, and the same is true with mental health centers. Um, I mentioned before shelters, uh, victims of domestic violence have experienced brain injury, so it does live there. Things can happen on the workplace um, and certainly within military service. So you see a little bit about causes of brain injury and where it is. All these things can happen to a person at any time, at any age, in any situation. You know, it is an equal opportunity condition and um, can cause a lot of issues. So where is brain injury within vocational rehabilitation? Um, often we tend to think only about a caseload that is specialized, that only serves individuals with traumatic brain injury. That is where folks who have been diagnosed and probably follow a very traditional trajectory of trauma to emergency room, to hospital stay, to home, um, where those cases end up. Um, what may not land in that caseload are some of these other areas. Um, because damage to the brain can cause sensory loss. Individuals who are low vision or blind or individuals who are hard of hearing or deaf may go with um, a primary diagnosis that falls in that caseload that um, also has a traumatic brain injury that gets missed. Um, and then if the VR counselor doesn't know about it, they may not be able to to address it as well. And perhaps the person goes on to school or on to work and things don't go as planned and they don't understand why. Um, if children and youth experience brain injury in a high school setting, um, those um, cases live in a transition caseload. Um, some VR systems have specialized caseloads that work only with those with mental health issues or addiction issues. Loads and loads of undiagnosed brain injury there. <clears throat> and then VR gets referrals from outside sources like Department of Corrections, like Juvenile Justice, um, from shelters, from recovery centers, from veterans programs when people are not active duty anymore and they're back um, living their lives as civilians. Um, they may get referrals even from a Title V program that serves children and certainly within a general caseload. Often spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury go hand in hand, but maybe the spinal cord injury gets addressed and the TBI does not. So brain injury is a little bit um, everywhere, but doesn't live fully in any one place. And I think it's important to, to note that. Severity of brain injury is loosely determined by loss of consciousness. Um, does that mean that where the majority of the brain injury is occurring, which falls in that mild realm, um, just because someone has a loss of consciousness or does not, um, they may end up with some pretty significant temporary or long-term challenges, even though it's considered a mild brain injury. Often, even though that's the majority of brain injury, um, individuals may not seek medical attention. So often um, that's where that TBI gets missed. Moderate and severe traumatic brain injury is what most people are most familiar with because um, often the changes are more obvious. Um, the short-term memory loss you know, is there, they're having longer term or lifelong challenges related to behavior um, or cognition or social challenges. Um, and those are more obvious to us. But it's important to think about severity because, you know, things do happen. As people have brain injuries in lots of places, um, they can also have more than one. Um, you're not limited to one TBI per life. 
um, things can happen again. Um, and it's important to note that repeated brain injuries are a very big deal for some. Uh, after someone has a first TBI, the risk of having a second increases. After a second traumatic brain injury, the risk goes up um, pretty significantly. So why might that be? Um, people are often kind of baffled by that. Well, you guys know um, in the work that you've done um, with some of the challenges that come along with brain injury, um, again, with this frontal lobe that you have, that's kind of the home of you and the home of where good executive um, function happens. When those things are damaged, um, individuals have difficulty making decisions. They have um, issues possibly with impulse control. Um, there may be uh, reduced processing speed in terms of um, getting and interpreting information that's shared with them. Their reaction time may be slower. So those things often set people up for being in a situation where traumatic brain injury might happen again. So with concussions or mild brain injury, one plus one does not always equal two. It can equal more than that. Um, athletes that get back on the field before their brain has had time to heal may have something that's called second impact syndrome. Y'all have seen a good bit about that, I imagine. But repeated exposure uh, with sports, um, with intimate partner violence, with combat, um, create some challenges and perhaps only one of those brain injuries has been diagnosed. So a person may be seeming like they're having more challenges than what the brain injury may um, indicate. So I just kind of like to point that out. You also may have a mix of some underlying conditions related to um, mental health or addiction disorders that may complicate things. Just a list of some challenges that may come along with brain injury and a reminder um, about physical changes, um, headaches, uh, difficulty sleeping or wanting to sleep too much. Fatigue is often um, a challenge. Um, individuals with traumatic brain injury often experience seizures. Those can diminish or go away over time or they may last. Um, Changes with balance or speech can be their behavioral challenges, depression and anxiety. Uh, if you work with individuals with traumatic brain injury, you know that those are kind of hallmark behavioral challenges for a person um, often. Um, I mentioned um, impulse control before. Um, people with traumatic brain injury often describe feeling socially isolated. Um, that's not a good feeling for anyone. Um, and maybe they have some reduced capacity to deal with that. Um, and some challenges with how they remember themselves before and some of the challenges that they might be having now can cause some behavioral challenges with a person. What's cognition? I keep mentioning the word cognition, cognitive challenges. Um, our ability to take in knowledge and understand it and do things with it. So um, our memory, our ability to attend to one or two or 12 things, um, our sense of judgment and making good choices, um, our ability to comprehend information that's coming in and information that's going out, all that's, you know, landing pretty much here. Um, in our old frontal lobe. And when that gets damaged, these things get damaged too. They can cause some pretty significant challenges for a person uh, who may feel like they're entering a maze, which is the image I have in the middle of this slide. Um, challenges with prioritizing, challenges with um, really sticking to good problem solving skills and long-term planning. Um, staying organized, being flexible when change comes our way, um, and, you know, really setting good long-term goals. Um, all these areas can kind of wreak havoc with a person. Um, one of the most key things on this slide is that decreased awareness of thinking changes 
Um, sometimes individuals with brain injury may have difficulty seeing the deficits that they're experiencing um, and being able to translate that into what that might look like in terms of work. So it's just important to note. I put this slide in here as a teaser for what Stacia is going to talk about with you guys on the next webinar. Um, but I just want to point out, I keep mentioning substance use and addiction disorders. Uh, what's the big deal? Well, um, our colleague John Corrigan at um, OSU has said this many, many times. Substance use is a risk factor for having a brain injury. and Brain injury is a risk factor for developing a substance use problem. One can lead to the other, you know, and vice versa. And so what's the big deal when we talk about brain injury related to that? Well, someone who's had a traumatic brain injury is going to have some increased sensitivity to what they put in their body. That's going to impact medication that comes in, um, alcohol, uh, prescribed drugs, illegal substances. Um, they may have a completely different reaction than what's indicated by the medication as well. Um, when substance abuse happens, um, it can lower a person's threshold for having additional seizures. You don't want someone to be in that situation either. We know with looking at uh, research related to opioid use that 70% of individuals who have sustained a traumatic brain injury are prescribed and using opioids immediate post brain injury. Maybe, you know, the challenges that come with managing that or knowing when to cease use of that um, can impact a person. And often, Finding a prescriber, a physician that knows what those issues are for somebody with a TBI is a very difficult thing often to find. So just because someone, you know, is able to prescribe, they may just not know brain injury as well and um, may be sharing, you know, the wrong things. So what can we do about those things? issues and really help um, staff best accommodate for, for things that um, they might see related to changes in brain injury. Let's just talk a little bit about some overall observations that you or an employer um, might see that can interfere with someone um, heading uh, towards work. So individuals who have had a traumatic brain injury may, um, depending on where that brain injury occurs and translating it to what um, tasks are going to look like that you're asking them to do, they may have a difficult time uh, because of short-term memory issues, taking in new information. Old information may stay intact, but learning new things may be a challenge. That can be a challenge entering into a job or it can be a challenge uh, when somebody gets promoted or additional tasks are added to what they already have. That's new information. That can be hard for a person. Um, there may be some inconsistency in performance. That could be due um, more often to not, um, maybe to fatigue issues. Perhaps somebody does better in the morning but their energy lags in the afternoon. And so they have a peak with performance and then it decreases. It's important to know that. Some days are just gonna be better than others. Um, there's this difficulty taking, again, how somebody experiences run-of-the-mill tasks and generalizing that to a new situation. Um, maybe there's less follow through on tasks. Sometimes that looks like a lack of initiation or that someone's not interested, which may not be the case at all, but follow through may not be good. Um, somebody with a brain injury might have a difficult time uh, really maximizing what they've learned from some intervention that's been provided to them. Again, you know, it's, it's generalizing to a new situation that could be a challenge. 
they may just seem more confused or inattentive or inattentive or just that they have less energy than other people. So just things to be aware of um, that may get in the way of a job search or making a good plan or going to work or, or staying employed. Um, a person's ability to manage some of these things may um, indicate a higher or lesser degree of success um, depending on how well they're managing some of these things. So I just put it on a slide that's called predictors because these things have a lot to do with a person's um, moving forward towards good employment outcomes. Um, whether or not, or not a person is aware of some of the challenges that they may have. Um, are they motivated? How can they make um, good decisions? Are they able to display that they can? Um, can't say it enough, a good support system um, is so critical to someone's well-being after a brain injury. That's true for all of us, but particularly with somebody with brain injury, um, it's just so important. There's addiction and behavioral health. Um, those add some layers of complication that um, may make things more challenging with somebody's ability to do well in the world of work. There's stamina and fatigue again. Um, someone's ability to make and maintain a relationship is going to either carry them through to good employment success or may get in the way. Um, that may um, come in the form of uh, counseling or job coaching or coworkers or a boss. Um, so it's important to, you know, be thinking about those things as well and, you know, working on these things. Your own level of expertise about brain injury and how it impacts people is going to, you know, be a huge indicator sometimes of of success. Um, are you doing all you can to really know that person, help guide that person through what they're experiencing and on to good employment outcomes? People with brain injury um, are different, you know, just like snowflakes. You hear that comparison a lot in the world of traumatic brain injury. And if you've worked with one person who has a traumatic brain injury, you've worked with one person. Um, over the years in working with newer um, vocational rehabilitation counselors, um, their perspective on taking on a new case um, completely depended on their one or two people that they had met who'd had a brain injury. If it was a good experience, um, then they felt pretty good about it. If it was a bad experience, they weren't so sure about taking on new cases. They thought everybody might have those same challenges and that's just not true. Um, because of this new normal that happens with brain injury, and you know, I use the word normal, um, doing air quotes, um, often that's how individuals with uh, brain injury describe themselves. You know, I was this way before, and now I am like this, and this is my new normal, and that's hard for me to adjust to. Some people have a very difficult time making that adjustment that may get in the way of employment success. Sometimes, um, if there's a lot of hidden challenges, um, there may be this overestimation because brain injury is a hidden disability uh, on the side of the employer, or for that matter, the counselor, um, about someone's skills and abilities. Um, just like people are underestimated, sometimes they can be overestimated and that can get in the way too. So what are some successful strategies um, that we can put into place that are going to help with success? In the years of work that I did within vocational rehabilitation, um, as an employment specialist and then in the field of brain injury, um, and in talking with um, some of the staff that we had here in my state, we had specialized caseloads for traumatic brain injury um, with vocational rehabilitation and with pre-vocational rehabilitation. And 
it really made for a seamless transition of services because from the moment the person had their injury, before they even left the hospital, there was somebody there helping them and their family understand what was going on and providing them with some strategies to put in place at home to make that next jump to being involved again in community and dealing with those social and behavioral and physical challenges well before they were ready to be referred to a traditional VR counselor and head to work. Um, it really uh, is a best practice mode of approaching um, brain injury. And it required a team of people addressing each person, but it was well worth it. Um, I can tell you um, that the traumatic brain injury caseloads in our department um, traditionally um, time in, uh, year in and year out, had some of the highest wage averages with that caseload because they took the time to really stay current in best practices, which is the first point I have on here, remaining skilled providers, you know, in brain injury, and taking the time to work with a person through that whole process. Uh, if you're not familiar with who a neuropsychologist is and getting an assessment from a credentialed neuropsychologist, that is so, so important because um, it's the only way, the best way for a person to learn um, during that feedback after testing how they're functioning, um, what are their areas of challenge, what that means in terms of home and work, what kind of supports need to be in place, um, what kind of problem solving techniques to employ. Um, and that neuropsychologist during that feedback sits down with the individual and sometimes the family and the provider to walk through those things. Uh, it's important to have that in your toolkit as a good way to guide what a plan is going to look like in vocational rehabilitation and more importantly the person who's experienced the brain injury learns a lot from a professional who works in this field about how they're going to best function um, so you know that's a really important um, professional in your community to get a hold of if there are no neuropsychologists in your community, maybe you're in a rural community, I'd say the next place that I would go would be finding a speech and language pathologist because they really understand a lot of the behavioral challenges that come along with brain injury better than some other disciplines. We had a mantra within VR for brain injury, which was uh, start low and go slow. Um, ease back into school if that's where a person is headed. Ease back into work. You don't have to take on the world all at once. And, you know, if you nudge someone to do that, you're setting them up for failure because if it doesn't go well, how's that going to impact them wanting to do things later on? Um, so, you know, if a person is interested in heading to college or heading back into college, Maybe audit a class to start off with. Take a class at a time. See if it's even something that um, a person can manage without being worn out. Um, a person's academic skills are not the same as work skills. So if a person does well in one, it might not be an indication of how they're going to do in the other. Um, spend significant amounts of time um, doing some mock interviewing before you send someone out to search for employment. Help guide them with a thorough job search based on their skills um, and challenges. Instead of starting with full-time work, start with career exploration or volunteer work, some kind of unpaid work experience, again, so they don't have a negative impact on wanting to head towards work at all. Um, Department of Labor has some wage and hour tools in the toolbox that you can use to support those things with businesses. So take advantage of those. 
help a person with knowing what their challenges are and how to describe those challenges if they're interviewing and when to describe those challenges when they're interviewing and what not to share. Help them be comfortable with disclosing information about the challenges that they have. I mentioned group approach before, kind of staffing um, cases within VR as a group was often very helpful because it could be challenging. Um, keeping a small caseload, a specialized caseload works well, I think, um, for individuals with traumatic brain injury. Um, and then being ready to keep a case open for longer than what a traditional VR counselor might want to do. There's a minimum amount of time before a person has to close a case. Um, the successful brain injury counselors that I have worked with here um, kept those cases open for way, way longer than that minimum amount of time because they wanted to be sure somebody was going to be successful and they did a lot of follow-up at home with that person once they went to work to make sure things were, you know, going well. I'm going to hearken back to talking a little about substance use again. Um, a, a VR counselor that works with individuals with traumatic brain injury may want to keep um, recovery in mind. Um, you may want to have a longer amount of time if you're asking for somebody to have gone through a recovery program um, before sending them towards school or toward work because they may need it. Um, individuals with brain injury don't often fare well um, as I mentioned before in a group setting, maybe they've tried to participate in a 12-step program before and it hasn't gone well. So there are some customized approaches to working with somebody that has those issues that counselors may need to be aware of. So some things to think about in terms of um, making good job matches and areas that, you know, are critical to think about as you're helping guide a, a person towards a good job match. Um, if memory loss um, is a challenge um, and a person has um, verbal issues or spatial issues related to the, that um, cognitive challenge, finding something that is um, more repetitive, more structured, more routine oriented may help that person be more successful. If processing speed is an issue, um, things not to do would be to ask a person to think about um, jobs that require a quick response time, uh, like driving. Um, return to driving is, is a very big deal. Um, Maybe interacting with the public might be a challenge. You know, if it takes a person a long time to process information that's coming in and then give appropriate responses back out. Executive function deficits. Um, someone that's uh, not so good at organizing um, or problem solving may need some help with the logistics of searching for a job, may need you to lay out what a good schedule would look like for a job search and what's realistic um, in terms of locating a job opportunity, filling out the application to the best of their ability, you know, responding to interest um, with an interview and so on. They may need some help organizing those things or you may need to show them how to organize those things for themselves. If there are challenges related to awareness of self, awareness of skills and deficits, um, again, interest in a job or academic abilities don't always translate to job skills. You know, I would, this is silly, but I would love to be a singer. But if you have heard me sing, that is not an option for Maria. <laughs> um, someone would need to tell me that possibly and not to head toward that. Um, that is not going to change and no amount of desire is going to place me there. Um, really hone in on 
painting an accurate picture with a person, not necessarily for a person, but with a person about what their skills are, you know, really emphasize their strengths. And, you know, if you need to um, talk about what challenges that you see that have been pointed out, you know, from assessment and your personal experience about how their challenges might not land them in the vocation that they're looking at, you know, some other things that they can consider. Um, it's okay to, again, you know, to start slow with employment. Um, if long-term planning is a challenge and you start off talking about jobs that are, are entry level, um, maybe really repetitive, you know, it's a good idea to maybe approach it like that's our first phase, you know, is to start here. That's not going to be where you end up. We want to start here and then build towards things that may be more challenging or may require more physical or mental energy from you as we go. That's okay. So these are just some strategies as you work with individuals um, with traumatic brain injury to, you know, kind of keep in mind um, and accommodations. They work well for a lot of folks. They're rather universal, but I think in particular, it's good to keep these things in mind as you bring people in to your office or you meet them in community um, so that they can get the best out of the experience and you can get the best out of them. Keeping uh, noise and environment and lights um, and distractions to a minimum when you can. Um, keeping meetings short. Um, keep in mind somebody may have chronic headaches or fatigue and their ability to attend to long chunks of information may be a challenge. So keep things short, at least initially. Um, keep things very structured. Uh, whether you're just meeting with a person or you're asking them to do multiple things, um, make sure that what you're asking for is kind of structured. Um, schedule some breaks. Uh, work on one thing at a time. Don't throw multiple things at a person and expect them to maybe figure out which one is most important. Uh, again, limiting distractions. That's visual and verbal. Um, As you meet with a person, do some check-ins with rephrasing um, what you're saying in a different way or sharing information in multiple ways. You're saying it, you're also giving it to them in a written format, and they're also taking notes. Just check in, make sure that they're following what you're saying. They may be nodding, but they may feel overwhelmed. So do some, some check-ins there. Um, as much as you can, advance notification of changes is always a good thing. Um, generally, as counselors, um, we're taught to avoid uh, closed-ended questions because you don't get a lot of information from a person. Uh, sometimes with traumatic brain injury, it's good to stay structured. It's good to avoid open-ended questions sometimes. Um, you need information in this amount of time, so you know, keep people in the concrete, not in the abstract. Share things very factually. Um, don't interpret a lack of emotion as a lack of interest or motivation. Um, that's very important. Um, we also tend as people to want to avoid uh, direct feedback because we think it's not nice. Um, but subtle Social cueing just might not do it with somebody that has issues with that um, related to a brain injury. You need to be direct, positive, but direct. Um, giving written information as much as you can is good and breaking steps down into miniature steps. Um, same with kind of helping a person organize tasks. So just some good general strategies to employ as you're working with a person and as you're thinking about where they may land in terms of employment. Uh, some very low tech uh, and more high tech kinds of aids in terms of accommodations. Um, 
it's not too old fashioned still to keep a wall calendar or a daily planner. Um, a person may need that to record meetings and keep things organized. Um, it's a good visual reminder of deadlines and things that are coming up so you can see in advance um, and a good way to keep up with contacts. Helping a person with checklists so that they can record the things that have been done and move on to the next thing with a specific routine um, and even prioritizing those things on a checklist is very helpful. Keeping a notebook um, kind of the same as a, as a planner, but um, we always encourage someone to take a notebook with them as they went on an interview and younger people often did not want to do that. Um, but it's a, it's a good way to keep up with what somebody's sharing with you. And it's a good way for an employer to see that you're paying attention and it makes you seem interested. So that um, is generally what we would say to someone who did not want to do that. Um, a timer to help monitor time during activities um, and using some people as supports um, for feedback. Uh, coworkers, you know, the counselor, family, friends, the job coach, all low tech. Um, high tech aids you guys are familiar with, notebooks, laptops, smartphones, uh, the number of apps to help a person keep up with their lives has just grown exponentially. Um, having a good GPS on a phone helps them find where their interview is. Um, and, you know, setting a timer helps them get there in the right amount of time. Um, still, people may use programmable watches or um, voice recorders, you know, with their phone or even with a pen to record information so they don't have to stop and write it down. But just a couple of things to throw out to you in terms of accommodations. And then kind of lastly, um, these are a couple of resources that I really uh, like accommodating, and these are hyperlinked. And if you cannot access them, um, Hillary and I have talked about sharing those with you later on. She'd be happy to do that, I know. Um, accommodating the symptoms of TBI comes from Ohio Valley. It is this lovely booklet that very um, basically breaks down issue with, you know, way to address it. Um, it's great for the person with a brain injury. It's great for the uh, service provider. And it's good for employers, too, because it's a quick and easy way to look at um, if a person has issues with processing speed. Here are the things to do when you're, you know, working with them. Great tool. Um, there was a recent article that came out um, in the National Rehabilitation Association Journal of Rehab um, late summer last year that talks about traumatic brain injury in the VR process. Uh, it has some great statistics in it about um, individuals with traumatic brain injury and about vocational rehabilitation with some strategies for putting together good plans and working with people to head towards employment that you guys might want to check out. Uh, as always, ODEP's Job Accommodation Network creates some quality materials. And if you've never been to JAN, the Job Accommodation Network site, I would encourage you to. Um, another uh, entity historically that's put out a lot related to supported employment um, overall and traumatic brain injury specifically is Virginia Commonwealth University's um, Research and Rehab Training Center. Uh, they have an employment q and I think that's, that's pretty good that might be useful for you. Um, and then our organization, the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators, provides training and technical assistance, you know, on a number of things. There is a brand new Administration on Disabilities uh, Disability Employment Training and Technical Assistance Center that's going to be producing a wealth of information to help with all disabilities, but there's a particular tract dedicated for TBI with some information that we're helping put together. Um, so call upon them for resources and you'll be seeing some resources uh, released through that organization in the very near future. Um, if you don't know where to go to find 
you know, your state person or your brain injury association or alliance connection. Um, our website has that information by state, both for um, state programs and for partners. So check that out. Just some upcoming training events we manage. Um, if you want to do a deeper dive with some issues uh, specifically related to traumatic brain injury beyond employment, um, whether it's criminal and juvenile justice, behavioral health, um, driving. Uh, we offer a series of trainings each and every year. We have an annual event in the fall. Feel free to join us. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has some training on it. And then, you know, for a deeper dive, um, we provide some more um, targeted kinds of things in smaller groups. And that's all I've got. Um, I appreciate y'all listening to me and I hope this has been helpful to you. And Hillary, if you want to take some time and run through some questions, we most assuredly can. Maria, yeah, that was awesome. I started having like flashbacks when you were saying mock interviews with some of my former clients that had TBIs. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, but, uh, I we had a couple questions in the chat box that um, we can address. But before we get to that, I'm going to I've uploaded the PDF of the PowerPoint. I'm going to upload a copy of the certification of completion and a link to our website as well as the anonymous survey in the chat box for everyone. Um, and then I'll pull up. Jenny asked a couple questions. Um, she said, how much more susceptible to mental illness are those with ABI versus those with defined as a healthy brain? A good bit. Um, depression, I mentioned depression, anxiety right out of the chute. They're kind of hallmark issues for somebody who has had a brain injury, whether it's traumatic or acquired. Um, uh, individuals with traumatic brain injury are, have a much higher risk for um, suicide attempts. Um, and uh, other social issues, but you know, there are a number of studies that point at how much more susceptible a person is um, to having mental health issues with a brain injury as not. Um, and somebody's ability to cope well with those things, you know, often gets in the way. Um, so it's not just the issue, but it's also the ability to manage it. That doesn't mean that there aren't resources available for that. Um, we have two webinars actually coming up that talk about treating um, brain injury and mental illness and training brain injury and addiction. And Stacia will talk about some of those statistics and some of those approaches if you want to tune in next week. Great. Um, we had a couple more questions um, come into the chat box. Do you want me to read those or do you want to? Sure. I'm just kind of <laughs> scrolling through here to see. Uh, um, we also, uh, Jenny asked another question earlier um, as well. Um, what resources are available to treat those with ABI to reduce and or treat those with mental illness? Medicaid, Medicare are not options for many clients with ABI. That is an issue um, and that goes across all states. And I would say in working with states um, in all my years with um, working in the brain injury field, that's probably at the top of the list um, in terms of need is having access to good, appropriate um, behavioral health treatment um, and medication and therapy um, that's covered by someone. I wish I had a good answer. There are some states that are tackling that um, issue right now, and we've gained a lot of traction in working with um, SAMHSA. If you do not know what SAMHSA is, that's a substance abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They're over all of the state mental health programs and addiction um, programs um, and are paying attention to um, some of the initiatives that states are working on related to brain injury so that they can incorporate some of that into um, what they do and individuals are not excluded from treatment. Um, so I wish I had an easy answer for you there. There's not one. Um, but I hope some are coming. Um, 
another question. I am a teacher for the blind. I'm challenged by teaching TBI blind skills. Um, can a TBI's memory improve? Um, who do we refer to help a TBI retain and improve memory to help them retain training? Uh, looks like that person is in Utah. I would say to connect with the Utah Brain Injury Program. Um, Tracy Barney is with the Brain Injury Program there. I might suggest starting with her. I'll bet Hillary has some connections in Utah she could help you with. Um, teaching good compensatory strategies for memory loss is important. Um, you can't fix a broken memory, uh, but you can work around it by employing some strategies, you know, that work in place of somebody's memory, um, if that makes sense. So putting some strategies in place to help remind them of things to do that they're not going to remember themselves is really, really important. Good. And yes, I can connect people with resources. I put my email in the chat box just in case you don't have it. Um, <laughs> And then we had another question. Can you give me some info and resources on cognitive retraining for TBI clients? I'm in Maryland. Uh, there are some things out there related to cognitive remediation um, and brain injury um, in a state that has a cognitive remediation program um, and could get you connected with the person that runs that program. Um, she could share some of their training tools and manuals. Uh, Tennessee also has some good uh, tools there, uh, and there's a whole toolkit coming out of our friends in uh, Australia um, very soon that is about that very topic, um, but there are a lot of really good resources out there that I'd be happy to send or, you know, give you some links for. And Hillary, I know you've got everybody's um, email, so if you'll, you know, help me get capture that, I'll send that back out. Send what back out? Sorry. <laughs> um, can hearing loss cause a TBI? Uh, a TBI can cause hearing loss. Um, I don't know, I don't think the reverse may be true, but I know a person with traumatic brain injury can have their hearing impacted temporarily or permanently. Any other questions? You guys can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat box. This was really great, Maria. Thank you so much. Like, well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. I hope it hit the spot. Um, even if you've been working with folks for a while, maybe there was something here that... Um, was helpful to you. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, March is um, National Traumatic Brain Injury Month, right, too? It is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, states have been engaged in all kinds of activities. No other questions? <laughs> All right. Um, 